Hi guys, my name is James Scully. I run a creative community called The Wall Breakers. That's www.thewallbreakers.com. And a lot of what I try to do with The Wall Breakers is help people build tools for a passionate career by partnering with each other, by giving them an outlet for their voice, also by just letting people know that the insecurities that hold us back are, are they're phony. We can, by talking to each other, by putting ourselves out there, gain so much knowledge, so much understanding of the way the world really works. And when I think about collaborative communication, it goes to something else that I think of, which is collective consciousness, that we're all in this together. That's what collaborative communication really brings about. It, you and I, we get together, we have similar goals, we speak with each other, we realize we're way, way more similar than we might think in our more insecure moments when we're feeling like, oh, the world, it, it doesn't know what I'm going through right now. It's so, much, it's so much simpler than we make it. It really is. And for this TED Talk application, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to start with a little story. Um, it's a cold, blustery autumn day in 1956 in New York, and there's a man. He's standing at his window, much like this window, at the Hotel Ansonia. He's looking outside at the passersby, and he's thinking to himself, oh, am I doing here? I, I belong in California. He's got an appointment that morning at 10 o'clock and he's not feeling very confident about it. He's been drinking too much coffee and usually by 10 o'clock in the morning he's already had his first drink. He is a published author but to himself he feels like a failure. He's standing at this window. He's looking at these passers-by. They're running for their cabs. It's raining outside. He's got one arm leaning on the windowsill sipping his coffee and looking down. Suddenly the phone rings next to him. He picks the phone receiver up with two fingers, puts it to his ear. Hello? Oh, Mr. Chandler? Yes. Your car is outside. It's time for your appointment. He thanks the woman, hangs up the phone, looks at the table in his hotel room. There's a manuscript in a manila envelope. It's for his latest story. It's something that he has to go for broke for. It's his last shot at what he considers redemption, although he doesn't feel like he deserves it. He grabs all his stuff, he takes one quick look at the room around him, sees there's nothing there, takes a deep breath, and walks out into the hallway. He's on the fourth floor, but rather than take the elevator down, he goes the back stairs because he doesn't want to see anybody, goes out the lobby doors, into a cab, and up exactly five blocks north in New York City to the Equitable Life Insurance Building but he's not going to buy any insurance. He goes through the lobby doors, into the building, and up to the seventh floor for the claims and purchasing division. He gets off the elevator, walks through the doors, into a bustling office. He's taken back by this. He's not ready for this. He goes to the secretary at the desk and asks her if it's time for his appointment. She said, what's your name? He says, I'm, my name is Mr. Raymond Chandler. She thanks him. She says, oh, Mr. Chandler, we've been waiting for you. Please, have a seat. Mr. McGillcuddy will be right there with you. Chandler sits down at his chair. He's just thinking to himself about all of the failures that he's had in life, about why he couldn't be good enough at this. Why, as a published author of almost 60, anybody should take his word about anything. He's so wrapped up in his own nonsense his own failures, that he doesn't even hear the secretary calling his name, Mr. Chandler, Mr. Chandler. He looks up at her, she says, Mr. Chandler, Mr. McGillicuddy will see you now. Please, down the, down the hallway. He thanks her, he gets up, takes his manuscript, looks down the hallway, and what he sees is a gilded chandelier every five, ten feet. A carpet so thick that he thinks he needs a bowing knife just to cut his way through it. He walks down the hall to the ground glass door at the end of it that says McGillicuddy purchasing. He stands outside this door thinking to himself, what am I doing here? Why am I not back in California? Why did my mother disapprove of my marriage to my wife? All of these things that they go through our head, that they keep us where we are. He doesn't even realize that he has his hand on the knob for what could be 10, 20, 30, 40 seconds. He doesn't know. Finally, he takes a deep breath, grabs the knob, opens the door, and walks into the office. And what he sees 
behind the desk is a seven-year-old boy with a propeller hat on playing with matchbox cars. And he's so taken back he doesn't even know what to do. But then all of a sudden, a slap on his shoulder and a guy with a stubby cigar with a big grin on his face says, <laughs> Chandler, how you doing? So glad you could make it. Please, I put, them, I put my son in front of that desk just to play with you a little bit. It's a way that we could break the ice. Of course, we want to buy your manuscript and publish it. Do you have a name for it yet? Chandler is so taken back, he doesn't even know what to say. He thinks to himself, and he says, along the by. Now, the semi-apocryphal story that I just told you was a story about an author, one of my favorites, Raymond Chandler, who did struggle with alcoholism and self-doubt in his life, who married a much older woman only after his mother died, and when that woman died, his life took a further tailspin. His last great novel in the 1950s was called The Long Goodbye. His main character is a very famous detective known as Philip Marlowe. Chandler wrote what the New York uh, and the LA Times called at the time like a slumming angel. And the point of this story is that in our most insecure moments, we feel very alone. We feel like everything that we're going through at this moment, no one else in this world has ever experienced and we're the only one who can fight through it. And that is so much further from the truth. It's the exact opposite of the truth. Collaborative communication means that you and I, we sit and we talk. And we realize that the things that we want out of life, a sense of creative involvement, um, inner peace and financial stability, they're the same things that no matter what country that you live in, so long as it's in a developed world and survival is not a prerequisite just to living, we all want, if you live in America, if you live in Canada, if you live in Europe, what are we all searching for? It doesn't matter the language that we speak, it's a universal language. We all want to collaborate and communicate with each other. There are so many things in this world today that are segmenting our lives and making us feel further apart than we all really are. Even if you think about just the Democrat and the Republican race for the 2016 presidential election, the quicker that we realize we're all in this together, and that what we want is really the same thing. And that, yes, you also have to compromise at times. But in that compromising, you tend to realize that what you thought you needed out of life is so much less than what you actually need to be happy. And that when you can free yourself from all of the noise and all the BS that we import into our lives based on what we're brought up to think, based on what society tells us we should be doing as a job, as a, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis... It's collaborative communication, and it's a collective consciousness. You and I, we are alike. And when we realize that, life feels much less lonely and much more confident. And then we can look at the things that we really want to do, whatever they are. We can all write them down. We can all say to ourselves, I'm most happy when I'm doing all these things. And if you take failure out of the equation and, and don't think to yourself, well, that can't happen because X, Y, and Z and you just write down what you want, chances are there's a much clearer path to that solution than we think. I have experienced many times in life where I felt like I couldn't accomplish something, only to then when I regain the clarity that makes us people and remove the fear and the insecurity and the emotion from it and say, oh, okay, if I do it this way, yeah, I, I think that this will be a solution. And even if it doesn't work that way, it's a doorway to something new because Collective consciousness and creative collaboration is very much a doorway. I want to give this TED Talk, and this is just a, a, a slight little kernel of what I could possibly say. There's selfish reasons there. There's me wanting to put myself out there further past my comfort zone than I've ever done. I talk in front of a lot of people. Yeah, I have a podcast. I've gone to public speaking things. I have never really been afraid to put myself in the spotlight. But there's a selfish thing there. There's a, a self-validation that you try to achieve, or I want to achieve, in doing something like this. But then there's the other part of it there. It's that I am part of the whole. So yes, while I want to do something like this to spread a word and to really sit down and formulate what have I been doing the last three plus years with the wall breakers and pushing people's art in pushing communication. Why am I doing this? And what are the, you know, this is a philosophical thing, um, collective consciousness, collaborative communication. A lot of TED Talks 
are very philosophical, but they tie into actual reality, as you and I know. And when I think about the bigger picture as to why to do something like this and why to want to be a part of this is that because ideas worth spreading, information worth spreading, technology worth talking about, communication is key. So is content, yes, in this world. It's a forget-me-not world, as we know. There are things that are here today that are going to be gone tomorrow. But the truth is that the tenets that we build happiness from and we live successful lives from, those are as universal and long-standing as Rome, as Greece, as any kind of ancient society that we still know about today. The foundations which they were built on are the same foundations that we build any society on today. And by society, I don't necessarily mean America and the government and the nationwide society. I mean our community, the TED community, the Wall Breakers community, the community of Brooklyn, of Bushwick, of Williamsburg. People come to New York because they want something very concrete out of life. They want to be part of what's happening. But what's happening is right now, and how we can achieve and be present in that time is through collaborative communication. If nobody cared about how I felt, I would either have lots of despair or I'd have to figure out why that is. And there is self-validation to knowing that we in a community all feel a certain way. And that way isn't through the process of dredging up fear and making us afraid of change and afraid of continuity. No, 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 no. It's about understanding that we are part of something larger than ourselves. It's why kids join sports teams. It's why kids join gangs. It's why people stay in office jobs longer than they want to. There's a sense of community that we all need to be a part of. And collaborative communication you and I getting together, talking about life, about what we want, about how to go about it. That's as pragmatic as America itself. America, to me, as an American, is not about perfection. It's about progressive continuity, about getting better each day, about expanding our minds. And while well, I'd love to be part of this TED Talk process, and I would love to be able to speak next year at TEDx in Bushwick. I would love some feedback too, just anything that you guys can provide to me about what I could be doing. If you please go to www.thewallbreakers, T-H-E-W-A-L-L-B-R-E-A-K-E-R-S.com. You can see some of the writing that I've done there. Um, I also have a podcast that's available through iTunes and through SoundCloud. It's called Breaking Walls. If you go to thewallbreakers.com, you can see in the right-hand rail there's a chronological feed through SoundCloud of the latest podcast. I'm up to number 26 that will be coming out this Friday. I am very excited about an opportunity to possibly hear back from you guys and wanted to record this video so that, besides that I have to, but also so that you would see how I am in front of a camera naturally speaking. I don't like to use a script. I just think that in life... You should have bullet points that you want to hit on, and you fill in the blanks as you go. If, if you need to withhold yourself to a script, um, then if you break from it, it creates insecurity in that. I want to know where I'm going, but the journey to get there, that's the details that we fill in as we go. I, I'm just trying to figure out what for, what's for dinner tonight. And if I try to think about where I'm going to be when I'm 80 at 30, can't work that way. But I can get there tomorrow and, to, and the day after that through collaborative communication. So I'd like to thank you for taking the time to hear me, to look at me, to see this talk. I'd love to hear anything back from you guys. That's james at thewallbreakers.com. And thank you very much. And uh, get out there and keep breaking those walls.